Psalm 89, the first <coughs> eight verses. Need to say the first eight verses about the love and faithfulness of God. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Praise God. Praise God. I wonder, do we sing of God's love? Do we fully know God's love? Because here the psalmist is proclaiming that. With his mouth he'll make known God's faithfulness. And for all generations through our lives, we can make known God's love and his faithfulness. He declares in this psalm that God's God's love stands firm forever. It doesn't waver about. Not like me, maybe perhaps a little bit like you sometimes, that we don't feel quite so loving. But God's love stands firm forever. John, in chapter 4, and from verse 7. Quite a well-known passage, but there are quite a few points that come out of it when we look at it. 1 John, chapter 4, and from verse 7. In this epistle, John was writing to the Christians to warn them of the errors and false teachings that were going around in the churches at that time, and still are today. And he then goes on to talk about the love and faithfulness of God and our responsibilities in reply to that love. So that's Chapter 4 and verse 7 from the first epistle of John. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. There's a 
illustration about sacrificial love, which has been, as far as I know, going around quite quite a long time. Um, the last part of it, I've got my doubts as to whether it's true, actually, because when I look into the history of this particular person, it gives me quite an opposite indication of what happened. But the main story part of this illustration does fit for any of us. Years ago, a young mother was making her way across the hills of South Wales, carrying her tiny baby in her arms. And they got caught up in a blizzard, <coughs> and they were no, not able to carry on. <coughs> Excuse me a moment. <coughs> They weren't able to carry on. And like sometimes sheep in the fields up in the hill country get buried in blizzards and sadly die. This young mother got caught up in the same way with a baby. And when they came to dig her out, they found the mother had passed away. And as they moved the mother away, they found the baby wrapped up in the mother's outer garments, still alive and healthy. Is that not a story of sacrificial love? A parallel of what Jesus did for us, giving his life for us. We might be saved and come to a knowledge of God and the Saviour. The popular story then goes on to say that years later that child, David Lloyd George, grew to manhood and became Prime Minister of Great Britain. I'm not sure that's true because I've looked up the history of David Lloyd George and it gives no indication, in fact, it always <coughs> indicates that the mother was still alive into their, at least their early years of childhood. But let's not dwell on David Lloyd George, that's for another time perhaps. Let's dwell on the sacrificial love that was given by Jesus Christ for each one of us. Well, in this letter, this epistle of John, he was writing to church leaders <coughs> and Christians. We don't know exactly who these Christians were. There's so much in this letter that is for our benefit too. There are plenty of distortions of sound teaching at the time in the churches. They didn't have the benefit of the full New Testament. And perhaps there was a temptation to sort of make it up and adapt it as we go on. And that's not really the way to go. But we have the word of God which we can follow, must follow, because it's our guide and our direction. The letter also encourages them to recognise God's love and show that great love out to other people, to other believers and others around. But what about that word love? It's so easy to say, yes, I love you. Judas indicated <coughs> an upward love for Jesus, a false love by a kiss. So easy to say, I love you, but inside there's something different. But exactly what was meant by love in John's letter, it certainly wasn't that kind of variable love. Now you know there are eight different Greek words for the, the kinds of love. One John uses, and that familiar one we all know well, agape. We say Christian love and think of this word, agape. And in the New Testament, this word is used to describe the love that God has for humanity. For you, for me, for everyone. Such a deep love that he sacrificed his own son upon the cross. Agape is often defined as unconditional, sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that's felt by a person willing to do anything for another. <coughs> without expecting anything in return. That's hard, isn't it, sometimes? 
when we love something, we don't get the response we want or think we should have from it. It's hard. God's love has a great depth. There's one time a father wanted to teach his son a lesson of God's great goodness. And he took him to the top of a very high hill, pointed northward over Scotland, somewhere out that way, I think. <laughs> then he turned and pointed southwards over England, eastwards over the ocean, and westwards over the hills and the valleys. <clears throat> and sweeping his arm around the whole circling horizon, he said, Johnny, my boy, God's love is as big as all of that. Mm. Why, Father, the boy replied with sparkling eyes, then we must be right in the middle of it. Mm. Are you in the middle of God's love this morning? I pray you are. So the first 12 verses that we read earlier, show a great depth of God's love. We've been born of God. We have his love in our hearts. We're told that God is love. And he showed his love amongst us by sending his only son into the world. That we might live through him. Not through our own goodness, our own strength, but through him <clears throat> and his sacrifice an atoning sacrifice. Then John goes on to say, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. The depth of God's love for each one of us Paul, writing to the Ephesian church about God's love, wrote this in chapter 2 and verse 4. But God, who is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, even though we were dead, because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Then there's those well-known words from chapter 3 and verses 18 and 19. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too, too great to understand it fully. And I'm using the New Living Translation of that particular passage. Oh, to re fully receive that love of God, to fully experience it. It's vastly different, far greater than any love we shall ever know from one another here on earth. I wonder if you've ever felt wrapped up, <coughs> wrapped up embraced, enfolded by God's wonderful love. Yes? No? It's there for you. It's there waiting to embrace you even in those very difficult circumstances. In the good times, in the hard times, times of confidence, times of sorrow and doubt, <clears throat> times of joy, times of boredom, times when we were overloaded with things. <coughs> we have God's love, it's there, and it's waiting to release our joyful praise, to conquer our fears, to remedy our doubts to sustain us through difficulties and sorrow and uphold us no matter what. There's another illustration. Centers on C.H. Spurgeon, that great old Baptist preacher. One day C.H. Spurgeon was walking through the English countryside with a friend. As they strolled along, the evangelist noticed a barn with a weather vane on its roof. At the top of the vein were these words, God is love. And Spurgeon remarked to his companion that he thought this was rather an inappropriate place for such a message. His companion thought and said, 
Well, Spurgeon thought and said, well, the veins are changeable, but God's love is constant. I don't agree with those words, Charles replied to us. Charles, I'll read that again. So, I don't agree with you about those words, Charles, replied his friend. You misunderstood the meaning. That sign is indicating a truth. Regardless of which way the wind blows, God is love. God is love. And so many people don't know the real love of God in their lives. They might feel great frustrations, as I did many years ago. They may feel daily sorrows, deprivation, prejudice, anger and hurt. And I'm sure we've all experienced those emotion, emotions in some degree in our lives, and probably still will. But the love of God surpasses all that. If people can become aware in their times of need, the love of God, a new spiritual life, can be theirs. And then, the love of God has a transforming power. In verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then we get goes on to tell us that we have his love living within us, his spirit. And if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he lives in God. And so we know, so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. It's transforming. There's that song of Graham Kendrick, quite popular, and we've sung it here sometimes. Lord, the light of your love is shining. And of course, we know, shine, Jesus, shine. Echoes the fact that the light of God's love can break into any situation. Is God's love shining in your heart? Right now. Forevermore, is it? Can we perhaps draw back any curtains we might have that are shutting out some of his love? Can we open the blinds fully that might otherwise hinder God's love in our lives? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. How dare we try and shut him out? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but have the light of life. John 8 and verse 12. You don't have to walk in shadow and darkness because you've got God's eternal love in your heart. And when God's love touches people's hearts, there has to be a response. Many people might ignore it, might ignore that love. They might not recognise it. Many will reject it. Some will want to know more and receive it. God's love changes things. Albert Barnes in his notes on the Bible wrote this. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also <coughs> to love one another. One, because he is so much exalted above us, and if he has loved us, those who were so inferior and so unworthy, we ought to love those who are on a level with us. Secondly, because it is only in this way that we can show that we have his spirit. And thirdly, because it is the nature of love to seek the happiness of all. I love to see people happy. Sometimes I've given stuff away and someone's come to pick it up, trying to reduce the clutter that's accumulated over nearly 40 years of living in one place. And I had an old photographic piece of photographic equipment. It's way, way obsolete. You don't use that sort of thing now. I thought, I'll, I'll put it up for free. 
And I didn't get any replies and it was getting a bit rusty and tatty and it had been in the shed for years. Totally abused, but then I got one reply. I said, yes, my wife would like that. So this chap came along in the car and his wife, she was disabled, and she was sat in the car. He took this piece of equipment out to her. You should have seen her face, it lit up. <laughs> it was beautiful, I shall never remember that. Because she was, she used to, or she still did at, at the time, um, take classes and groups concerned with photographic history. And it was a birthday present for this horrible, <laughs> rusty looking old thing, which I'm sure he cleaned up. But, <laughs> But her face lit up, and I saw that spark of love between the two of them. But Barnes went on to remind them that <coughs> there were a few reasons why God should love us with sacrificial and unconditional love. In view of us being so undeserving, there are many strong reasons why we should love one another. Unless we do this, we show no evidence that we are God's children. We can be channels of blessing, channels of God's love to all, all who are part of the family of God. That was Albert Barnes' take on the love of God. So what should be our collective response as Christians? Respond in love to other people without prejudice, expectations or assumptions? That's a hard ask, isn't it? Because we're human. We have our own thoughts and ideas. We've been hurt perhaps in the past. We draw back from fully giving of love. But when we're filled with God's love to overflowing, then it's going to show in our demeanour. It's going to show in our words, in our actions, even in our eyes and our expressions. I don't know whether you've ever noticed a married couple, and I've noticed it quite a few times. Some occasionally, the man might be, perhaps, I don't know how to quite say it, but um, <laughs> not perhaps the most lovely of people. I met one chap once, he was quite loud and quite abrasive at times, but when his wife looked at him, there was that light, that connection between them. It's almost indescribable. But boy, you don't come between that. Do not dare come between that. <clears throat> That's God's love to us. He looks into your eyes and my eyes. And he says, I love you. I love you. We've got peace. We've got joy deep in our innermost beings. Whatever the situation we're in. You might remember that beautiful hymn, and I haven't got time to read it now, by George Matheson. Oh, love that will not let me go. Mm. And if you're aware of the circumstances in which that hymn was written, it makes you stop and think. In verse 16 of our reading, Says God is love, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. I wonder how fully we do know that love. Like the light of the eyes of a married couple joined together. Not by some tenuous feelings but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we grow in God's love, and we never stop growing spiritually, do we? I'm still learning so much. Like a good vintage wine improved with age, we're becoming greater and greater channels of God's love. <coughs> but that has its responsibilities. In the last part of the reading we had, it tells us that God's love is made complete in us. We will have confidence on the day of judgment. God loves you, God loves me. 
that we're following the ways of the Lord when we come to that last great day we should not have fear <coughs> that's going to cast us aside a lady friend of mine many years ago and I was a new Christian at the time and I just said something about getting to heaven and I sort of said well if I get there he said how can you say that you've been saved that's once and for all. God's not going to go back on his word, is he? <coughs> Yet I was still doubting. Because I was looking at my own failings and faults still. Thinking, am I going to be good enough to make it? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has made it for you. We get back, back to my notes, haven't I? Otherwise, but your dinner is going to be burnt. <laughs> and we're all going to be late. The Pharisees tried to trap Jesus with a trick question in Matthew 22 and verses 37 to 39. And they asked him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Well, Jesus didn't fall for that. He knew what they were trying to pull him down. He went directly to the very heart of the whole law. And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like this. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. And that can be hard sometimes. But that's the core principle of living in the love of God. God's perfect love for you and me is far beyond any love that we can produce ourselves. But we can take his love. We can let it radiate through our whole person so that it shines out to other people around us. I don't know if you've ever met Christians sometimes you perhaps don't know they're Christians, but there's something about them that shines out from them. God's love. And so, our love is never going to be the perfect love that God pours on us. It will be a reflection. Let's clean the mirror of our hearts so that we reflect as fully as we're able to that love for one another and for people out there. We might find challenges with some people, even Christians. We perhaps just can't really get along with them. But it's still possible to have a tolerant, meaningful relationship. Differences don't need to be fought over, they can be acknowledged. We can perhaps live with them Sometimes there's very heated discussions and arguments over doctrine and churches get split and we've got so many denominations now I've lost count of them all but there's no need to fall out over it if we all follow the core principles of Christian living and Christian gospel. We can be sociable, having quiet words rather than anger and dispute or complete rejection. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers, it says in verse 21, my paraphrase. So there's great depth in God's love. It's a precious and perfect love. Let's receive it fully. Let's completely experience it. His love is there, waiting to release your joyful praise to diminish your fears, to support you through your doubts. Just remember if you have doubts about things and doubts about scripture or even doubts about your own salvation or what God has said to you, just remember Thomas. And Jesus said, fill my hands, fill my hands, fill my side. And Thomas believed. We can feel Jesus' hands, put our hands on his side, experience God's love through his word. 
in the transforming power in God's love. We can have peace and joy in our innermost beings. We can radiate our love out to other people as expressions of God's love. And God's love will bring maturity, reassurance and unity to believers. It's the perfect love for you, for me. It's far beyond any love we can express towards him or others. And we can take his love we can let it radiate through our whole person so it shines out to others. And others will notice, they'll experience a little bit of God's love. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. The second most important commandment is this. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. That, brothers and sisters, is the core principle of living in the love of God. Amen. Amen.